Okay, today we've got an extremely, extremely special guest. I'm very, very excited. Not only she's not based in the UK, she's based all the way from Montana. She's Dr. Deborah McCauley. She's, our, she's a founder of Veterinary Initiative of Endangered Wildlife. So she qualified from the Royal Vet College in 2003 and has seen embark on a career much unlike many vets that you may know. So without further ado, hi, Dr. Deborah, how are you? Hello, thank you for inviting me. Appreciate well, thanks it. For, thanks for coming on this call. I'm very, very excited. So shall we just start with the most common, simple question? Why did you become a vet? <sighs> do exactly what I'm doing today. So I definitely took a very different path. I didn't want to work with agricultural animals or companion animals. I wanted to work with wildlife um, and I wanted to work internationally. So the Royal Veterinary College was definitely the perfect choice for me, um, despite that, the challenges that I faced um, going from a US system to a UK system. But um, my choice was definitely to do the work that I'm doing today, which is incorporating wildlife health into conservation packages or efforts. How did you get involved in this wildlife in the first place? Like um, what, what inspired you? Was there a defining episode or something? You know, probably watching those kids, those shows when I was a kid of, you know, Africa and wildlife. I was very intrigued with wildlife. I was very fortunate. At the time I went to the RVC, they had um, taken a, four veterinary students from the RVC and we were able to um, work with uh, ZSL, London Zoological Society on our final year and did our final year project. I think we were at the zoo and the safari park for four months. I know they don't do that anymore, but um, so it just really sealed that I wanted to work in conservation, but um, I definitely worked in companion animals. Um, one of the things that I, you know, do I do conservation or do I work with wildlife? I wanted to be able to pay my bills. I wanted to be able to have the flexibility to, um, to actually work and, and do the things that I loved. So I practiced for many years. I worked in companion animals at the same time as did my wildlife work in Montana, working with Wildlife Conservation Society with wolverines. Or um, So I was able to, to marry it for many years. Now I do it full time. Mm -hmm. oh, great. And you mentioned early on that, you know, coming from America to the RVC in London, uh, you face some challenges. What sort of challenges did you face in college? You know, could you share with me, please? Yeah, it was, well, I came from a, a philosophy background. So I had science as well um, prior to going to the RVC, but it wasn't a very solid science background. I had a Bachelor, um, uh, bachelor of Arts um, degree prior to going to the RBC. Mm -hmm. So had I looked back, had I taken more sciences, I would have had, um, that would have been beneficial, but also there's a very different way of learning. And I think the RBC does it right in that they um, were able to do classes in the morning, case-based learning in the afternoon, and then written exams where in the US it's just, you know, multiple choice. Um, and so it was, very, it was a very different approach um, to that final learning. Um, in the US, there were a lot of exams, lots of quizzes in, the, you know, at, at, in vet school in the UK, it's really based on that, those final um, couple of weeks of exams. So and, how, and how did you find that? Was it okay? Were you, do you have to change the way you think? Did you have, what, what sort of challenges did you face with that change? that RBC presented? It was a huge challenge, I will say um, that, but I, I think it was excellent. I think I w w when I left the RBC, I was very prepared as a veterinarian. I was very fortunate to work. The advice that we got um, from London Zoological Society was that we should work and practice for a number of years before we go into conservation mm -hmm. and um, into wildlife. And I did work in an excellent practice in upstate New York. Um, in the Adirondacks and um, with two amazing doctors and only one technician. And we worked many, many hours. And um, I felt that I was very, um, very prepared for that. Good, and um, in working life, I mean, uh, I understand you say you're very prepared. What challenges do you face when you're working? Um, so I run an uh, NGO, a nonprofit organization, <clears throat> and I founded it, I won the Ashoka Fellowship because I'm doing cutting edge work, incorporating 
wildlife health into conservation efforts. So we did this in Nepal. We're now doing it in around the Yellowstone region in the United States. Um, we've been asked to bring our, our template to India, to the tiger reserves in India. And so um, the challenges, I was very, very fortunate. And I don't know about necessarily challenges, but it wasn't just straightforward being a veterinarian, seeing clients, which I love doing, doing surgery. I love doing that. Um, but it was, it's also about um, meeting people, collaborating people. We've had to have uh, lots of volunteers helping with view. I was very fortunate to have some of the top scientists and some of the top people in conservation helping to support view. Um, I met and became uh, my partner in helping found view was Dr. Gretchen Kaufman, who was the former um, veterinarian for uh, head for conservation medicine at Tufts University. She helped me um, form our program in Nepal, developing a wildlife health program, which incorporates wildlife health into their conservation efforts um, in Nepal. And so um, she really brought in academics and uh, sustainability and really building a whole program of um, sustainability, including veterinary students, conservation, and including um, not only medicine, but you know, really preventive care for the wildlife um, and developing diagnostic centers as well. So just for our audience, so uh, when Dr. Deborah was saying the word VIEW, so VIEW stands for Veterinary Initiative for Endangered Wildlife. And um, could you just tell us a little bit more, what does your typical day look like at VIEW? Um, well, it's changed over the years. It depends on, right now we're in the middle of doing a moose project. So we have a veterinarian down in Jackson um, doing necropsies on moose that have been, have found to have died due possibly due to disease. Um, so a typical day of view when I was working in Nepal, um, either we, I worked directly with the government and a local NGO and we would capture tigers or rhinos or if an animal died, um, I would go out and help with the government on how to perform a necropsy, a postmortem examination, collecting those samples. To I went out, you know, they didn't have electricity in their in the in the jungles of Ch Chitwan. They have a beautiful biodiversity center, but we helped um, establish electricity to be able to put the freezers to establish a laboratory out there to collect those samples. Well, it sounds as though your job is really, really varied from almost scientific to um, conservation to political as well, working with the government. Um, yes. May I just ask, how do you fund this? How do you fund this particular uh, organization? We've been really fortunate to have some um, family foundations and private donors. We also collaborate a lot. As I said, we collaborate with government and university and local organizations. So it's really threefold. Um, currently we have, as I said, a moose project. We're here in Bozeman, Montana with Montana State University um, and USGS, United States Geological Survey. So they're doing the climate change work on the, on the moose project to see if disease has a climate change component. We're working with Wyoming Game and Fish. So the teams that go out there when we're immobilizing moose, they're out there immobilizing moose and um, our veterinarians are helping to immobilize them at, and all the components of safe capture techniques, training with that. We also um, built a electronic record system, so wildlife health information system, so that when I was working at um, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, there was a big Excel spreadsheet. When we got information on disease back, it was very clunky and not very efficient. Um, my partner, as I said, Dr. Gretchen Kaufman, she and I and a number of veterinarians, but predominantly Dr. Kaufman, um, we built a database that um, put on an electronic database system. As if you go to the hospital and you get all that information, now it's very easy to input that information, who captured that tiger, what samples were you taking, uploading photographs of those animals. So it's very easy that the veterinarian in the field can share that information with the government organizations um, with the government in either Kathmandu or in Wyoming. So information is very easily shared. In fact, we were just on a very large um, Zoom with federal and state agencies and universities and Wyoming Game and Fish um, is using our WISP program for the Moose Project 
And they said, wow, we've not had a place that can integrate all this information. So uh, my day is filled with lots of things from developing WIS to um, you know, talking to our veterinarians in the field and helping with you know, how do we put together safe capture techniques to also um, talking to donors like this afternoon. I have, um, I have a meeting with a donor, so. Wow, so when you, actually just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Shut the window, it was a bit too noisy. <laughs> okay, um, so when you say that you, your team, how, how big is uh, your team? Like how many people are we? We really depend a lot on volunteers. So um, we have a veterinarian that's right now in, in the Tetons. And um, we have a scientific advisory council of about five or six folks from one um, faculty member, research faculty from UC Davis, um, two vet state wildlife veterinarians from Oregon and Idaho, to another faculty member at Montana State University. Um, who help um, to, we meet with, we meet with them um, on a regular basis, either individually or in groups to discuss some of the projects that we're doing, um, or they volunteer and come out into the field um, as we, they have in Nepal um, to train the local professionals, either the, in Nepal, it was training post-mortem examinations and um, safe capture techniques to the folks that are actually doing the captures in the field, including always including veterinarians and always including women um, when we can in those, um, uh, on those training sessions. So our team is small, but, um, but very um, strategic and we just have an excellent top team, I will say. I'm very fortunate. Wow, and um, do you have a lot to do with the public? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of what I, my job is starting to segue is what I'm doing right now. Um, I have next week, we'll be doing a, a YouTube, I mean, I'm sorry, um, a TED's talk to talk about our WISP program. So I have to share um, conservation efforts have really focused on habitat encroachment, um, anti-poaching efforts, climate change, but they haven't included wildlife health. And if you can think about COVID-19 and how a virus has spread across the world and has had an impact on humans, just think about how disease could potentially ha having a huge impact on our threatened endangered species. I'll give a quick story. When I was um, working for, y for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, we got a call out of uh, a bighorn sheep die off. And so we went out into the pastures and in front of me was a wild sheep ram, totally emaciated um, and very, very uh, sick, was wobbling in front of our truck. He, he fell over, um, we all got out of the truck and he was standing there gasping his last breath and he died. And when I looked into the pastures ahead of me, I saw dead and dying bighorn sheep. And what we diagnosed was that the domestic sheep um, was carrying a normal pathogen in their nasopharynx and passed it to the wild sheep and wiped out 90% of that wild sheep population. So like when the settlers came to North America and brought with them smallpox and diseases that wiped out 90% of the Native American population, um, but did not cause any, you know, much difficulties in the, in the settlers, uh, this is what's happening to our threatened and endangered populations, that disease from domestic animals and humans, predominantly domestic animals and agriculture animals, can pass to our wildlife populations and can wipe out our populations, but there's not much work actually identifying cause of death. So that's what VIEW does to help include investigating disease in wildlife so that we have measures to prevent and that's what's so exciting in conservation. Rarely are you able to find answers to these problems. But as a wildlife veterinarian, we can actually identify disease. And there are some diseases that we have preventive measures that we can stop, um, like vaccinations, that we can stop mass die-offs. So what, I mean, apart from five years in RVC, or six if you intercalated, 
what other special skills or courses or techniques did you have to learn to be able to do what you just described? Some of it I can relate as a general practitioner. Some of it is totally different and you need you know, special training for that. So what, what sort of experience have you been through in a vet journey to get you to where you are right now? You know, veterinarians are unique. Um, and one of the things that we, we are able to do, I, I, as I said, I won the Ashoka Fellowship, which is a entrepreneur fellowship. Um, globally recognized. And, um, and I think we are, we're, we're entrepreneurs, we fix problems, we solve problems, and we interact with people. And, um, and I really enjoyed my clients. I loved working in a little town of Livingston, Montana, or in a little town in upstate New York, working with my clients. I loved working in a team um, as you know, as a veterinarian, what was great about the RBC is that they helped made us really right away start working in teams. And so I've incorporated that uh, as our teamwork. Any practice I worked at, I always incorporated rounds and in incorporated teamwork. And then I just do that now in, in veterinary initiative, endangered wildlife, we initiate programs. So we have to work in teams because what we're about is not Dr. McCauley going in the field, although I, I love working with tigers, that was really wonderful and exciting, but it's also about initiating programs, sharing the knowledge that we know so that they can go on, the people that are actually doing the work on the ground can go on and, um, and carry out the work um, that we, we shared with them. And so I think that, you know, it, I've just built on what we learned in, in, um, at the RBC. I mean, obviously my first degree was in philosophy. I do think that having that liberal arts degree was excellent. Um, I didn't at the time. In fact, when I was at the RBC, I'm like, why did I spend all this time in a liberal arts education? But because I was a mature student and I had that liberal arts education, I could really bring that with me to problem solve. I, find, I found a lot of people were, um, we're checking the boxes and not really thinking outside the box. And I was, re I have to be able to think outside the box on a daily basis. I love my career. I cannot tell you when anybody ever asks me to be, you know, I want to be a veterinarian. I get so excited for them. I, I have the best career in the world. I've chosen the right path for me. And I've, you know, I, I've developed it in a way that I love. I can't say that, um, being a student at the RVC was easy. It was the biggest challenge of my life. There's no doubt. Capturing a tiger is easy compared to going to the RVC. <laughs> I, I, I can attest to that. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I was very interested in sort of zoo and wildlife as well. So I did spend quite a bit of time in the zoo as well working. So that was very, very interesting. Um, so you were, you were saying, I mean, it sounds, it looks and you very, very clearly have this huge passion for what you're doing and clearly you have made the right choice. What sacrifices do you think you have made in your veterinary journey? See, I don't, I don't see it as sacrifice. Of course I have had sacrifices. I had to live in Thailand for a year. Was that challenging? No. I mean, I've lived in Europe. Um, most, you know, I, I just came back to Montana uh, January 2019. Um, and I've been very, very fortunate that my family has been able to travel with me. One of the biggest challenges at VIEW is funding. Um, we are very, very underfunded. And so I have been the one to sacrifice because I want to continue to see VIEW grow. So I wouldn't suggest to everybody to start their own NGO. It's not easy at all. And, um, and so particularly in the way that I'm doing it, in that I'm not finding fun, we're collaborating with government and state agencies and they help fund their portion of it, but they don't help fund you. So um, that was, that's the hardest part, but I, I chose the right path. I, 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 you know, because I went, did an undergraduate degree and then I did science. I don't see the years as being the sacrifice really. I mean, because you're gonna choose a career that you're gonna do for the rest of your life. And what's so exciting about veterinary medicine is you don't have to be pigeonholed to vaccinating dogs and cats forever. You can do other things and it can be academic, it can be research, it can be travel, it can be global. So that I think is one of the, it's definitely the best, um, one of the best careers out there, I think. Following the thread, just uh, the, the the thread that I just mentioned, which is extremely true, are you still in touch with many of your 
uh, friends from college or are you in touch with a lot of vets uh, like like in practice in US? Yeah, I have a lot of veterinary friends. Yeah. Um, I, I not necessarily from the RVC because you know they might oh. not be in wildlife, but academics and research and in practice, I have a lot of veterinary friends because I I tap into that. I mean, I work with wildlife, so you know, does anybody want to help me? Shucks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, so that's really helpful. Um, yes. I just wanted your sort of input on this particular uh, question that I do have really. So right now, presently in UK, we do know that uh, in the veterinary profession, we do have quite a sort of high depression rate, high dropout rate, um, high suicide rate. Is it similar in US? It is. What are your thoughts on that? Like, um, do, one, do, do, can you think of like, why is this happening? Your thoughts on that? And secondly, do you know anybody? who fits into either, you know, drop off from the profession, depressed, or even unfortunately ended their lives? Um, I do know one veterinarian who did try um, to commit suicide because of a family problem, a child in her life, um, and probably because of access to the ability to end their life so easily. Um, I think that it's very sad that we have that, I think one of the biggest challenges that I had as a veterinarian, um, although I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the depressed person, I'm always the person with the, with the glass half full, even if it's not. Um, so, but it was, you know, euthanizing pets was challenging for me. I just hated it. Like that was the one thing I couldn't stand doing. Um, and, um, and so, and there were very long hours. Um, you know, that, that you do have to be able to take a break because we do burn out. We as veterinarians, we're, we're not trying to make money. I mean, no matter what, um, our, our objective to go into veterinary medicine was never to make money. It's nice to have it. It's nice to be able to support yourself. Um, but our objective is to do good, is to solve problems, is to help people and to help animals. And so, when you can't meet those objectives because, and we will work to the bone until we get it right or until we can. And that's, I think the biggest challenge that veterinarians have is to know how to balance when to, um, to take a break. And I have been very fortunate when I worked in mixed animal practice, when I moved to Montana, um, I worked, um, I worked part-time and part-time with wildlife. So I was very fortunate I could work with a practice here in Montana. But when the guys were going out to capture a wolverine, they would call me in the afternoon and say, hey, we have a wolverine at a trap, we need you. And I was very fortunate that veterinarian who was the owner could help you know, fill in the space when I, want, when I needed to do capture. What I found was that in practice, because we, as I said, we worked in teams and I loved working in teams and I always came in pretty positive because I had these two things that I was doing um, the technicians like to work with me because they thought I was more positive. Um, and I think it's because I was working, um, you know, four days a week or maybe sometimes three days a week. Um, although I remember one year, my uh, tax accountant said, Deborah, 40 hours a week is not part time. So, <laughs> so, you know, as veterinarians, we think that 40 hours a week is part time, right? So, um, so it, so we, we can burn ourselves. I, when I was in upstate New York, you know, I was working 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week and, you know, in the really busy summer months. And that's just not sustainable. And you do burn out. Like eventually you're just going to say no more. It sounds as though you managed to have that joy and passion that you have because even though you're working in practice, you actually had a sideline, a side passion. And you sort of knew that it's not 100% in practice uh, doing this. You love it, but there's something else that keeps you going as well. And yeah. not many vets have that. Like you say, 40 hour a week is part time. I, I, I do remember that when I went back to Singapore uh, and I'm from Singapore and I did, had my glasses done over there. And I went inside there and the storekeeper and the, and the shop girl was asking, oh, so what do you do? I'm a, I'm a vet working in the UK. What are your hours like? I was like, well, it, you know, every day, uh, the weekdays is about sort of uh, 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock, so to speak, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And she went, oh, part-time. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> in Singapore, they finish at 10. 
So yeah. They trust me. So yeah, I'm, and there's okay. no pay in Singapore. I mean, I asked a taxi driver once and he's like, yeah, I've been working seven days a week for 28 years. I'm like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. So, and it does sound as though, you know, the whole act of euthanasia isn't just putting pets to sleep, isn't it? It changes. It really changes a person. Um, yeah. person who is doing it and certainly the access to euthanasia drugs it's in my opinion is a huge big reason why the suicide rate may be as high as it is because the access is just so simple and straightforward um, yeah. that, and that is very very tough what what are your thoughts about because I think for you you got very very lucky because your passion is in veterinary medicine but there was a side aspect to it, not just purely in practice. What are your thoughts about people who are solely, vets who are solely in practice? Is it inevitable that they would face that if they do not know how to balance their work life? Because, you, you, I mean, we can very, very easily say, and I say it all the time, don't take work home. But yeah. come on, <laughs> you do what you do. You go home, sit down for dinner. You're just thinking the injection I gave, is that the right dose or not? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think that it, it, you can't shut it off. And, um, and so as much as, and even to the degree I found the reason, you know, I would have loved to, you know, maybe do surgery twice a week and then do better, you know, my work. And I couldn't because of where view was going, but also because no matter what, you cannot have a patient in surgery then, you know, and like let the rest of the practice take it, take it over. I will say when I first got out of practice, that's not true. The two veterinarians I worked for were phenomenal and they would take over those cases. But basically you could not take it all, you just take it all home. And, um, and that's a really quite unfortunate because you, if you can't turn it off, um, then you just, it's it's challenging. If let's let's pretend if you had a magic wand, what do you think needs to take place? What do you think needs to happen? What do you think that needs to change to help vets cope with being vets? Say that again. So if you had a magic wand, yeah. what and you can do anything you want and create anything you want. What do you need to see, what what do you think need to you need to see happen or change or create such that vets would actually um, n- not struggle being vets from those factors that you just mentioned? So um, so there's the in practice domestic animals and agriculture animals, and then on a daily basis, I get veterinarians asking to volunteer and work for me. So what I would love to see is that there would be money for in conservation for veterinarians who are interested in doing my work and sharing and doing the domestic animal and agriculture animal work too, but actually being able to fund those veterinarians that are interested in getting in the field and doing the conservation work. But that's the same token. I would say um, if one is in practice and they're, you know, getting to a point where they're really frustrated. I do have veterinary friends that work in practice, but also have really cool work in research as well and do what I did in conservation and research and be able to to find that balance. The other key factor for me, um, because if you look at my passport, I have, I, I was in Nepal for two and a half years over the course of developing the wildlife health program with really little kids. So I have a husband that's fantastic with the kids who's, who helps, you know, you know, pick up the bootstraps. I mean, I would be gone for weeks at a time. And these kids, you know, my kids were like two and four and <laughs> like really little. So I had, I have a really, really supportive husband, which is a critical factor. And I knew this early, early on. I surround myself, all my, all of my girlfriends are my best friends are superstars. I mean, you know, Raquel, you've met her. She's, that's how we met, right? I have superstars as friends and um and these women veterinarians are and and just i and not just veterinarians my one of my my closest friends was a number one ultra runner in the world who i used to run races with and when i first started out as a veterinarian i was not only working a lot as i said but i was also training for ironman and training for 50 mile races 
So, um, so I was very physically and emotionally, you know, um, intellectually challenged and I loved that. But I also, you know, it's really important to surround yourselves with people that really believe in you. And that is in any career. And if I could give any young person advice is to make sure that you follow your passion, but you make sure that you make that everybody around you is, is going to follow that passion too, that is going to believe in you and that is going to, you're going to do it. Very you important. Really, you really choose your friends very, very carefully. Uh, yeah, I don't have time for people. I honestly don't have time for people that don't believe in who I am and don't believe in what I'm going, what I'm doing. Absolutely. It's not, it's just not in my makeup. There, there is a very sort of well-known saying, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. So yeah, that's, that's so it. true. That's very, very true. Very, very, yeah. It's a, thanks for sharing that. That is very inspiring and, you know, very deep in that way because it's just so easy to just hang out with friends and just do things. I don't hang friends. out. <laughs> I don't really have much time for that, right? I don't, so. I mean, what you're doing, I don't think you have time for hanging out. And, that's, and I think that's the difference between um, high level performers and just average performers. The high level performers, they don't hang out. <laughs> they actually, yeah. you know, the, the purpose is so obvious and so strong. And it sounds as though you have got a very, very strong purpose. And that probably what keeps you focused. And you haven't got time for depression. You haven't got time no. for this. Exactly. It's like, I don't have time to do that. my what thing. Is that? Whenever people say I'm depressed, I'm like, just go to work. <laughs> just follow what you want to do. And I do have people say, you know, but I don't have a passion. And it, does, it, it doesn't make sense to me because I, it was always a part of me that this is what I wanted to do and this is where I was going. So it, I don't understand people that don't have passions. It's very hard. Um, I'm sorry. That's, that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing because if it was suppressed when you were a child, I will say, I, as I said, I did a philosophy degree first. And I, through that degree, I had to really think about what did I actually want to do as a kid? And so when I did that, I was able to really look at and say, I really want to be a wildlife veterinarian. Why do I keep telling myself I can't? And that's when I decided that I had to, you know, take my sciences after college and then, um, and go to, you know, go to vet school. It's quite interesting when you actually look at the definition of Webster Dictionary for veterinary medicine, it's talking about the art and science of helping animals through medicine. So I think, the science bit, we definitely got it nailed down in college. Yeah, yeah. Art, <laughs> not so sure. The art, I'm not so sure. I think that really develops each person, uh, each uh, individual's personality. And in your case, uh, you have obviously done an arts degree before, and hence it yes. puts you more in a sort of balance. And I, I, I think that that is very, very important. And uh, it sounds as though, you know, uh, someone just asked me, you know, ha having, having a goal, having a passion is good. I'm like, no. It's essential. It's essential. You can't get through vet school without having that passion. And I do say, if you're not 100% in it, then don't do it. I, I remember my stepfather who was a, a doctor and he said, okay, now you, know, now you wanna go to vet school, it's 150%. And at that time I was working um, uh, with at Cornell University at a research laboratory um, with mushing sled dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was very passionate about my horses and, and the huskies mushing sled dogs. And there was a lot of projects we were doing, we we're nutritional studies. And I kind of had to really start saying, wait, my priority has to be getting into vet school. And that's 150%. And once, once I was able to shift gears and say, I'm on my goal and my path, it, those, your grades come, your friends come, your, your focus comes. And it's easier. I will say it's easier because if you're just doing it for somebody else, like your parents or because of society, I, that's not, that's not a way to do it. It's got to come from inside. I think if you don't know where you're going, you may just end up anywhere. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, or a place where you don't want to be. And that's probably depression. That would be depression for me. Um, yeah. Or if I didn't reach my goals, that would be horrible. Yeah, it's almost as though, um, well, like you said, really, if you have a very, very strong goal, you haven't got time to be depressed. <laughs> it's like, yes. I still got to get there. <laughs> so to yeah, speak. yeah um, but, you know, and I will say, you know, the, um, the uh, peaks and troughs, when you're at the troughs, you do need to have, that's why I was saying about my husband and my friends, you need to have a friend base um, that helps you through that. And, um, and those, those um, networks are critical. 
just so you mentioned a little bit about money, let's talk a little bit about that. So it is not unusual, uh, especially in practice, if you remember those days, uh, I mean, uh, we do have the public's perception is, oh, you're a vet, you must be minted. What <laughs> would you say to that? Well, in my world, because I'm doing work that just there isn't jobs out there, it's really, it's a very challenging to get funding. Um, and so to get funding in wildlife veterinary medicine, I hope someday that this changes and I hope that we prove, view helps to prove how important it is to incorporate health into the conservation package so that governments and local NGOs and family foundations really do start funding it. Um, but as a veterinarian in practice, you're not there for money. If that was your objective, you shouldn't go into veterinary medicine at all. Um, unless you know i you know i don't know any veterinarian that that is making a mint off of being a veterinarian i'm sure there are but i just don't what 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 are your thoughts of uh, how do you think the public perceives vets what's the public's perception really well i mean i think that the public this is one of the best careers that it has excellent public perception because what are we doing we're honest people we are, um, we're doing something, we're trying to help animals, we're trying to help people, we're trying to solve a problem. And we're trying to fix things. And we're doing it from our, you know, from inside, from really from our, and, and I think that perception is, is viewed well. I, I remember one time I was told that 60 Minutes tried to do a show on veterinarians that were just trying to make money and they had to cancel the show because they <laughs> they kept on putting these hidden cameras and the veterinarians were just failing miserably. I'm like, oh no, no, you don't have to pay. Oh no, no, let's do this. <laughs> it's like, why didn't they just do the show on how honest veterinarians are? So I think the per perception of veterinarians is true. I, I don't know if that's changing. I haven't been in practice, but also, you know, you know, talking to people about the work that I do, working with wildlife and threatened species, People have a very positive perception of that. The, the, the wrong perception, what I would like to get across is in, in human health and public health, in veterinary medicine and in conservation medicine is we're more, we prefer to be about preventive medicine, not about, you know, the end result and fixing the, you know, the, the broken animal or, you know, the, the putting out the fire. It's really, how do you prevent the problems in the first place? And that's where, you know, where we focus a lot of our time is prevention. Um, thanks for that. What would be your advice to anybody who is thinking of taking veterinary medicine, your sort of a, a tips for them, so to speak? Um, so the first thing has to be financial. Um, you have to try to keep your costs down as much as possible and not spend a lot of money on your education unless you can, unless you have family that is, is supporting you. Because probably um, another component of depression is being stuck. And if you have to spend 20 years paying back your loans and not doing what you really wanna do as a veterinarian, by the time you get out of that 20 years, you're, you know, you're exhausted. And so the biggest challenge that veterinarians face today, I think, is the debt that we have. And, and at least in the US and, and probably the UK as well. So if you just share a little bit, like what sort of monies are we talking about? For a um, I, I think that the veterinarians today in the US have like $200,000 debts. I mean, from, from the you know, undergraduate to the veterinary schools to the, um, to, you know, the room and board is, is really astronomical. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? You know, I hate to say it, if you can go to an undergraduate school, if you have to, you know, you don't have to in the UK, but in the US you do, and try to keep those costs down as much as possible, that's critical. And keeping your grades, you know, excellent. Mm, yeah, no, I can appreciate that because uh, I'm from Singapore. So when I went mm. to uh, RVC, I also paid international fees like you. So yes. it was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it was fairly substantial by the time I graduated and yes. I was all living expenses and uh, yeah. Living so expenses, they, yeah. Paying that off was challenging, especially when the pound dropped in value between my first year. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> Not so good. No, that was painful. Um, if you had a chance, and this is quite a philosophical question because you did philosophy, if you had a chance to go back in time to meet your 
to have a sort of half an hour meeting with your 20 or your 20 year old self what would you tell your 20 year old self to help her uh, navigate the sort of uh, struggles just a shortcut just to make your your sort of uh, challenges potentially a little bit easier to now any tips you give to your younger self yeah, I would say a li even a little bit younger than that was just more confidence. I was steered away from science. I don't know. I went to a women's college and they're like, oh, don't do science, do this. And I think I was, um, I, sh I think just having more confidence to follow what I originally wanted to do to taking more sciences um, and, you know, not wasting my time, you know, partying and playing. I think that's important, but really to really think about your ultimate goal and, um, and at, really at a younger age, just being more serious um, because it took me a while to say, oh, I definitely want to do veterinary medicine. And I'm glad I took the path that I did, but, um, but you know, and had I not taken it, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, and I was very, very fortunate to get really good advice from certain individuals during that time. As I said, I was living in Ithaca, New York with <clears throat> folks that were going to do to Cornell University and they were doing conservation. And so I got very good advice at that time to say, if you're going into conservation, people seem to be more interested in animals than, you know, maybe even conservation themselves. So um, I was very fortunate to get advice at a young age. And, and, and so probably just that path of taking a breath in your twenties, a little bit of a breath, and making sure that you have had some time to, to really think about what your ultimate goal is. Um, very, very good advice. Having a goal, it's uh, just back to having a goal again. If you have no direction, you can be yeah. given a speedboat, but you still have nowhere to go. <laughs> so yeah. you get the best opportunities. Um, back to view. How do you see... Or what, what do you see the future of VIEW to be like? What would you like the future of VIEW to be like? Yep. Um, well, as I said, I would really love to see that wildlife health is included in the conservation toolkit. And I would love to see our electronic wildlife health information system to be a global um, a global pro program so that people in the field actually have the ability to record. Right now, in the United States, there are two wildlife veterinarians for all the national parks. We now have more, I think, definitely in Thailand and um, probably even Singapore now. <laughs> um, but um, they have a very robust program at the Wildlife Reserve Singapore, by the way, um, in, in the conservation field. But so, you know, actually Asia is, is, is stepping ahead of the plate on wildlife health and including wildlife health into conservation. We are not doing it so well, I think, in the U.S. And I'd love to see that we really say we can't let nature take its course anymore. When you have such high amount um, of human population, human population has doubled since I was a child. OK, mm -hmm. and then just think about the domestic animal has, you know, has exponentially grown as well. And the diseases that domestic animals and humans can share with, um, with people, with uh, wildlife is, is astronomical. And if you can think about, you know, saiga antelope died, 210,000 animals died in a fortnight, yet tens of millions of dollars was spent on conservation land for them and saving them from anti-poaching measures. Those are important issues but we have to be able to include wildlife health to, so that we can understand if, if, you know, if there are diseases in populations and threatened species, and then be able to help prevent um, die off. So just getting veterinarians in the field doing necropsies is a huge thing, which isn't really happening right now. What's the best way for anybody watching this to help you, help view? What's the best way to do that? How do they contact you? What's the best thing you can get from them? Um, yeah. Well, just go on our viewwildlife.org website and press donate now. And that's huge. Very good. And then sharing it with your friends and really learning more about why wildlife health is the most unaddressed conservation issue right now, I believe. It's, uh, it's not an issue that's really addressed. And although there are problems, I'm not going to solve climate change and 
Climate change may not be solved, but guess what? We're targeting species like threatened species and endangered species and understanding why they're dying. Tigers can die of COVID, I'm sure. We don't know that yet, but they get COVID-19. They definitely, we know, get dog diseases like canine distemper, rabies, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. They found that over the 200 working elephants in Nepal, 24% of them have tuberculosis. That's something that was shared with people. So we know that there's a disease interface there. There is a lot of work how wildlife is giving disease to humans, but I'm interested in how humans, agricultural animals and domestic animals could be actually the cause of a lot of our population decline and threatened and endangered species. So view definitely needs to grow and, uh, and get more robust. So donate now. <laughs> I will definitely put your show no uh, your, your, your sort of website in the show notes below. So if you want to contribute to view, do make sure you go and visit their website, donate. If you're a vet, you've got time, you want to, you know, it's not just money, you can put in the time and effort as well. Also do contribute to that. Dr. Debra, it's been a complete pleasure having you uh, over here. You. I have learned so much from you. And uh, thanks for broadening my mind in uh, terms of what's happening around the world in America and in wildlife as well. It's, it can be so easy for people to get into their little bubble. So thank you very much, Deborah. Well, thank you for asking me to join you. I appreciate it. Very nice. Very nice meeting you. Okay. Bye-bye. Excellent. Okay, I'm just stopping the record.